Oregon, thank you. Maryland, thank you, Angel. Thank you all. <laughs> you all right? Yeah. You sure you all right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Boy, boy, boy. Yeah, you're looking at it like, what is it? <laughs> it's good to see you. You ever had one of them tough days? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Tough days. Yeah. <laughs> I, I am convinced that the closer we get to God, the dirtier we look. Mm -hmm. And um, God begins to bring things to the surface. As he elevates us, he begins to extract things out of us that are not like him. Yeah. So proper, let's put it this way. Proper isolation brings about elevation where God hides me. He holds me off for a second. He covers me. And that begins to elevate me. And in part of the elevation, there's some extracting and things that got to be taken out of me. And there's also some things that need to be deposited in me. So no matter what stage of life you're in, no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, you've never arrived. You will never arrive. You say, well, no, Pastor Lee, that don't make any sense. No, it does make sense. You will never arrive. This walk with Christ is not a destination. It's a relation. Amen. That's what it is. We're not trying to get somewhere. We're trying. We are being Christ here on the earth. And what that means is when I'm reflecting, when I'm doing the things God has asked me to do, I reflect his image. I reflect him and not just myself. And God is faithful. God is faithful. God is faithful, regardless of what we face, regardless of what we go through, Amen. regardless of what we experience. He's faithful. Yeah. That's a good thing. <laughs> All right, you ready to teach, right? Huh. We are in a series called Grow Up. Everybody say, Grow Up. Grow up. Say it like you mean it. Say, Grow Up. Grow up. Look at your neighbor and say, Are you growing up? Are you growing up? Look at your other neighbor and say, Are you growing down? <laughs> there is a difference. I, I don't know if I've told you before that. Burial and death look exactly the same. Something has to go down. But the difference is when something grows, something comes back up. Both go down, both are buried, both go through some difficult times. But the difference is what comes up. When something is dead, it stays down. But when something is grown, when it's planted, it grows up. And part of growing up means that I have to die to myself. That means die daily, yes, die to my emotions, die to my wants, die to even my desires. And it's not that God takes those things away or that God is trying to make you have a life that's filled with agony or pain. It's the fact that he's trying to align you with his plans and his purposes because those are the best things for you. Right, right. And all of a sudden you realize as you walk in this life, I don't know why I keep talking about this, but as we walk this life through this process, we realize that, wow, that's what I wanted and needed all along, God. So we're talking about growing up, and this is part three. So growing up, part three, we learned last week from uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 11, that growing up is all about maturing, and maturing is all about what? Responsibility. Responsibility. Everybody say responsibility. Responsibility. And as we take responsibility, we are responsible for what we say, what we learn, what we think, and what we put away or what we do. So this week, we're going to go a little deeper. And we're going to go to Deuteronomy 23, 12 through 14. And I'm going to read from the New Living Translation so we can grasp it. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Man, God is good. Like, for real, for real. Deuteronomy 23. New Living Translation, starting verse 12, and it says this. You should have a place to go away from the tents. You should have a tool where to dig with, there to dig with, excuse me. Use it to dig a hole when you sit down outside. Then use it to cover the waste from your body. Because the Lord your God walks among your tents to set you free and make you win the battle against those who hate you. One verse says your enemies. The place where your tents are must be holy. Everybody say holy. Holy. 
he must not see anything among you that is unclean and turn away from you. So tonight we're going a little deeper, I told you, and we're talking about grow up. This is part three. And, and if you have the title, this part of our series is called Dirty Diapers. It's time to clean yourself. <laughs> Dirty diapers is time to clean yourself. Now, we all know that the babies, they eat, they sleep, they poop, and they regurgitate. Not always in that order, and sometimes at the same time. And if you're like me, a new father, or if you're a father, or if you're anybody, I, I don't have a problem with looking at certain things, but I don't know, I changed my daughter's diaper today, and it's like, good googly moogly, how can something so beautiful, so cute, produce or create something so nasty? <laughs> I don't understand it. I don't like poop. I don't like poop. I do not like poop. I do not, cha I do not like changing a dirty diaper. And I say dirty. I, I can deal with the pee diaper all day. That's easy. Boom. But poop, and I'm surprised Alexis has not recorded me doing it. I, you'll hear me grunt. Ugh, girl. I, I make noises when I'm changing her diaper because it stinks. It's messy. It's sticky. And how you know it's sticky? Because I've got it on my hand before. Uh, it's stinky. It's just unpleasant to deal with. It's poop. And again, I'm like, girl, you're so beautiful, but you create such a mess. That's nasty. What did you eat? And one thing, help me understand this if you've been parents before. How does poop get on your back and your neck when you lay down on your back? I don't understand. That's not gravity. It doesn't flow that way. I, 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 no, seriously. I'm like, how do you have poop up here? And it's not like you're going back here because you can't read. You don't even have dexterity yet. How did you do that? And I know what it is. It's the devil. <laughs> the devil is out to get us. When we're changing diapers, he's trying to get us. Poop diapers. I don't like poop. But you know what? I thought about this, though. I did a little research. And you know, I, I do research. I, I like to give you the meat. I throw away the bones and I give you the meat. So here, here's some interesting facts that I found about poop. Would you like to hear it? Would you like to hear it? Yeah. It's not going to stink, it's just interesting. <laughs> now, poop is made up of 75% water. Did you know that? No. The other 25% is part fiber, dead bacteria, and live bacteria. That's poop. Healthy poop is shaped like a log or like the letter S. Some of y'all going to go home and you're like... <laughs> <laughs> you don't think about it. I know you are. Now, poop... Poop will float if it has gas in it. Did you know that? No. It only floats when it has gas in it. That's what it goes. I thought that was quite interesting. The average adult poops two pounds a day. That's true. Okay, elephants can poop 80 pounds a day. Thank God we don't work for a zoo. And a guinea pig's poop can smell sweet like candy. Just don't eat it. Ancient Romans used to dye their hair with pigeon poop. During the Civil War, bat poop was used to make gunpowder. A bird's poop is white because they can't pee. Did you know that? I didn't know that either. So you're getting a dirty diaper and a, I guess, pee too at the same time. By the time you're seven years old, the average person will have a poop, a pile as big as a car. If you collected all of it, but I hope you don't. And, and here, here's one you probably didn't know, and if you didn't know, you should know it. Poop is the way our body gets rid of waste. Did you know that? But unfortunately, some of us have been holding on to some things that waste our time, our talent, our treasure. We've been holding on to waste in our life where God is like, it's time for you to clean up. You're walking around with a dirty diaper. And the issue with that is, one, you should be cleaning yourself. And two, you don't even realize that it stinks. Mm -hmm. That it's messed up. That it's dirty. And for us as adults, and we're talking about the series of growing up, we should know a lot better. We should think about it. You can tell when a kid has a dirty diaper. One, you can smell it. Something ain't right about that girl. So I ain't right about that dude. I can just sniff it out. I can tell. Them old mothers just say, you can smell that. Mm-hmm. It ain't God. <laughs> Two, you can see by the way they walk. 
Think about it. You see a kid with a nasty diaper. And if they're walking, it's just, it's just, it's just a little extra weight on it. That's what it is. Three, you can tell because the person who's carrying a dirty diaper or who has a dirty diaper, they become a lot irritable than normal. And you can look at the parallels to a child, to the parallels of adult when it comes to us maturing with Jesus Christ. A lot of times we don't realize we stink, somebody else has to tell us. A lot of times we are walking differently, but we don't realize it because we're holding on to this waist and we didn't know it. Or we become irritable. And that means there's some things that, that are still wasting my time, wasting my talent, my treasure. There's some things I still have that need to be changed. And I'm not willing to change it yet, or I don't realize it needs to be changed. So I want to give you some things. How can we change a dirty diaper? Because if we're maturing and we're not putting away the things that waste our life, we have to really ask ourselves, are we really maturing? Are we really growing up? Are we really taking responsibility? Because part of maturing is taking the responsibility to put away those things that we did as a child, specifically those things that waste our life and are not like God. Matthew 23, 26 says it this way. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. And he's talking to them about being clean. And he says, blind Pharisees, or Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish that the outside of them may be clean also. Don't worry about what you see on the outside. It is really a reflection of what's going on on the inside, but it's, in psychology they'll tell you sometimes it's really not at all. We can put on a facade, we do it very well. Yeah. Some of us wear our funk very well. Yeah. Some of us walk around with our poop very well. We're, we look good, but we don't smell good. We look good, but we're not really good on the inside because we're still walking around with things that are wasting our life that we shouldn't hold on to. So what are some indicators that you may still have a dirty diaper? Are you ready for this? Yeah. Yes. It's an acronym. Okay. Diaper. And number one, you lack discipline. You don't know how to control yourself and you don't know how to receive correction. Proverbs 22, 6 says this, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from yeah. it. If you remember last week, we talked about part of maturing is learning. It's part of, learning requires that there be a teacher and there also be a student. And, and today, we do not have an issue of departing from knowledge. We have an issue of never being taught. A lot of us have never been taught the right thing. Or some of us have. Because in Pew Research says most people in churches today are unchurched. That means they've never been to church. They've never been to church. They've never, they've never grew up going to church. And it's not that God wants us to, to have church. He doesn't, it's not that he wants us to learn how to fit into this religion or this structure. It's that he wants us to under, he wants us to learn how to operate in his order. He wants us to learn how to have an honor. He wants us to learn how to operate in excellence and then have accountability so that we reflect him and not ourselves. But this requires discipline. And it's like, how can I expect to be self-disciplined if I've never been disciplined? Discipline is twofold. The first thing is, I'm going to whoop your behind. Okay, your parents are not going to go to jail, but how many of you have ever got a spanking before? Some of y'all who did not raise your hand, I know why I mess with you. Now think about it. Discipline is, is tough. Think, a baby, a baby needs their diaper changed because they cannot change it themselves. An immature Christian needs to change. They need somebody else to help them, to walk with them. And it's not to say that you're supposed to walk by yourself, but it gets to the point. They don't know how to step because they don't realize, one, something is wrong. And two, they don't realize how to change it or make it better. So they'll sit in their funk. We can sit on trouble. We can sit on waste. We can sit on situations and feelings and emotions for years and not even realize 
that there's something wrong. And it's like, wait a minute, this requires discipline. This requires us to, to have an understanding that, wait a minute, I need a teacher at the same time I need to be a student. And a baby needs a diaper because it can, cannot control the bowels. We know it cannot control. It don't know how to do it. It has not been potty trained. God will allow some things to happen to us in order to train us. Train us to, one, learn how to trust him. And two, what he says and how he says it, those are the things that we need to do. And nothing contrary. Let's look at Hebrews 12. This is Bible study. We're going to read it for a moment. Hebrews 12, chapter 7. In the Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7. You still with me? Yes. All right. Discipline is hard to talk about, I know. I've told you this before. Discipline is delaying something now for something better. Something good for something better. Hebrews 12, verse 7. Let God train you, for he's doing what any loving father does for his children. Whoever heard of a son who was never corrected? If God does not punish you when you need it, as other fathers punish their sons, then it means that you aren't really God's son at all. That you don't really belong in his family. Since we respect our fathers here on the earth, though they punish us, should we not all the more cheerfully submit to God's training so that we can begin to really live? Our earthly fathers trained us for a few brief years, doing the best for us that they knew how but God's correction is always right and for our best good, that we may share his holiness. Being punished isn't enjoyable while it is happening. It hurts. It's painful. But afterwards, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. God is about character. He's about developing our character. And one of the ways is he disciplines us. In discipline, I mean he corrects us. God's love. When God loves you, and that's why he disciplines you. It's not always comfortable or present, but it yields a profit. That means there's something valuable in my discipline. There's something valuable for slapping my hands. Don't do that. You ever seen a baby when they, they learn that something is hot? They'll burn themselves, and then later on, they'll tell you, they'll start preaching. Now, that's hot, mommy. Don't, don't touch that, mommy. Daddy, don't touch that. That's hot. I, I, I know. And how do you know? Because I, you learned. You got burned. And, but God doesn't want you to always get burned in order to learn. Some of, us, some of us, we do need to get our head knocked. I mean, trust me. I was one of them. I was hard-headed, and I had a soft behind. I'm not, I'm not afraid to admit it. My brother's here. He can tell you. I think my sister, Krista, got more whoopings than all of us. Than she did, yeah. My sister did. However, we learned some things. We learn some things from that discipline. And it's not to say, let, let me say this for all the politically correct people. I'm not telling you to beat your child when they're not able to walk, where they're not able to talk, where, where it, it, it messes up their functioning of living. But there is a correction that takes place. Hey, you, get, you feel those things. I did that to my nephews the other day at oh, the grocery store. Google move it. I'll tell you this story. We're at the Macy's shopping. Mistake number one. <laughs> I had both my nephews. One is seven. One is two. The youngest one is two. We call him Bam Bam. We call him Bam Bam for a reason. Bam Bam is strong. Aaron is strong. I mean, he is a bad boy. He can pull a whole rack down with one hand. And he doesn't care. He'll knock his head and get back up like nothing ever happened. Gary, my other nephew, he has slight autism, but he's as smart as a whip. So he'll do little things, and he said, look at Aaron, look at Aaron, look what Aaron's doing. I'm like, you egged him on. You, you did that. So they, they would try me, they would try me, because they know that uncle, I, would, I went and bought them, I took them on this little train ride, we went into the arcade, I had to leave after five minutes, because I was like, look, I know you have more money in your car, but we leaving. I can't take it anymore. It's just one of me, it's just one of me. So I, I, mean, I was like, so we got to get something else. So I said, let's go shopping. So we, that was meant. They were pulling stuff off the rack. They were kicking. And then other people, when they, you know, it's not their kids acting crazy. Oh, they're so sweet. And you want to smile. And I was trying to do like, I said, get over, get over here. Get over here. I didn't want them to see. I was like, yes. They're so sweet. Get, get over here right now. And they weren't getting it. So what I did, I, the, the, the fifth time, 
After I said, get over here, they come over to me and I said, I smacked that butt. He, he did a little jerk like that. So I smacked little Aaron. I, had, I popped his little behind. And his older brother was like, mm. And he stood there like he wasn't doing it. I said, Darian, I saw you doing something. Hold his hand. Hold his hand. So they'll hold hands and they'll walk. And all of a sudden, I walk forward. They're all the way down there. I'm like, how did you get back there? So we come back. It was, it was, I had to keep popping them. I had to keep, by the seventh time I popped them, I think they got it. Because I said, when we leave here, I'm going to wear your behind out. You ever had one of those conversations? When we leave here, just, just wait till we leave here. I, I was trying to bite my lip and I couldn't because my, my youngest nephew, he'll come, he'll do this little thing like this. He's about this tall, so he'll do, mm. When he puts his head behind his back, that means he's trying to be nice. Like he's, I'm being good, uncle. I'm being good. Mm. And then he'll go, see, see, like that, like that. No, don't, we're not shopping now. You was over there playing. So he'll do this stuff. But it was the seventh time, by the seventh time I was back, they, they were holding each other. Hey, hey, hold his hand. They got it. It wasn't enjoyable at the moment. You can tell by their faces it wasn't enjoyable when I popped them. I'm trying to do one of them little cops. Don't be not crying. That wasn't a real whooping. I didn't even pull off the belt. This is hand. Caribbean saying, oh, Lord. Uh-huh. I'm going to keep that by myself. I ain't going to say Some of them kids need to get whooped. You're not too old for a whooping. We are not too old for chastising. But God does that because he loves us. Why? Because we say, oh, they're just playing around right there in, in, in the mall. It's fine for them to be in Macy's. But what happens, let me just give you a perspective. What happens when we're out in the street? Yeah. And they're not paying attention. They're having fun. They're giggling. And he runs off because I've seen it happen. I know about one of my, when I was growing up, there's a boy by the name of Kenyatta. He was three years old. He liked to play around and do a lot of stuff. And Oh, that's cute. It's laughing. But he ended up playing in the wrong place and ended up dying. He was three years old. It was tough. That was hard for me. That was one of the first loss I've ever had. But it's like, see, we, we think discipline, oh, you're not letting them have fun. You're not letting them be kids. Oh, no, by all means, there is a time and a place for everything. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. There is. But most importantly, you got to understand this. If I can get you to have it right here, if you can get it now, you can get the discipline now, it will save you from the headache, from the death, from the turmoil, and from the pain over here. But you don't see it. In the moment, it's painful. It's uncomfortable. It's like, why do you do me like that? All my life I had to fight. All my life. And you want to hit me again. Hop on, you put your hand. I'm sorry. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Come back, come back. Come back, Pastor. <laughs> the question is, how do we respond to the discipline? That's a mature question. Depending on how we respond to discipline depends, it determines how much we gain from it or how much we benefit from God's discipline. You got four options when it comes to discipline, how you respond to it. One, you can accept it. You can accept it. Okay, I accept it, God, but you withdraw away from God. Yeah, I know you had a discipline, but well, why? Oh, Lord, please don't let my daughter do that. <laughs> Rebuke you, Satan. No, somebody says she will. That's what I'm saying. Uh, just because yours did that, don't mind. <laughs> it's all love. We withdraw from God. Most people, but it was church hurt. Them people shouldn't have treated me like that. They were only correcting you. Well, you shouldn't do it like that. Hey, brother, sister. Hey, man, I'm telling you. Hey, no, no. Mary, don't do that. Mary, don't, don't, don't walk you out there. Martha, why are you over there? Just come over here. Jesus, you don't love me. I'm over here cleaning up for you. I'm doing all this stuff for me. But you missed the biggest part. Come to my feet. Let's have a relationship. I'm just correcting you so you can get this at its moment. Because I won't be here always. My father always tells me this. He says, one of these days, and I'm like, Dad, make it sound like it's an epic movie. But one of these days, I'm not going to be here. And you're going to remember my voice. That's the only thing you're going to have. You, can, you can't come to me. But you're going to remember my voice. And this is what this is what the Holy Spirit is, that's what the Holy Spirit is there for. But this is what God wants us to do. Because there's times we'll have all hell break loose on our life. You're getting hit on the left, on the right, up, down, all around. It's like, oh gosh. And, and it's hard 
Sometimes it is really hard to pray. It's really hard to fast. It's really hard to even hear God. But then you can almost remember the words. I remember when I first smoked marijuana, I was 25 years old. And I wanted to move out my parents' house because I bought, I bought my house at 22 years old. I was living on my own, lost it, can't have to move back home. Long story short, I'm there, and I, I was like, my buddy was like, hey, let's go get this condo. So I'm there with three of my buddies, and we get this condo. And my dad says, hey, you know what? Bad moral, corrupt, good character. That's right, that's right. I don't think you need to move out. I know you want to. I know you're a grown man, but don't move out just yet. And I was like, deuces. <laughs> and I leave. And I remember the words of my father. The moment I hit rock bottom, when I'm sitting there, I'm high, I'm depressed, and I'm, I'm in this debate, and I remember the words of my father, bad morals corrupt good character. I had never smoked marijuana in my life. Never. Was not even enticed by it. But because I'm in this environment, yeah. I tell you, there's no such thing as wrong people, just wrong places. Because Right people can be put in the wrong place and they let their environment shift and change them. This is why God said you are carried to his presence. You're supposed to change the environment. But it's hard to do that when your internal is messed up and you're still carrying some, some waste. So the first thing with discipline is it, it, we can either we can accept it, but we can withdraw from God. Or two, we can accept it, but have self-pity for ourselves. But God don't love me. God, I don't deserve this. They did me wrong. And we start thinking about all the stuff that ever happened bad to us. And we have self-pity. So now we play the victim role. And God is like, I'm doing this to make you a victor. But you play a victim. This is daddy's love. This is daddy's love. I love you. This is why I'm doing this. Because see, this is just a pat on your behind. But when you get out there, they're going to knock your head. The enemy is not here to play games. He's trying to steal, kill, and destroy. I'm just tapping you. And that little, that's really a love tap. That's what that is. It's a love tap. Thank you, Lord. I was saying that this morning in my prayer. Thank you, Lord. Earlier today, going through some stuff. And it was like, oh, it just hurts. But thank you, Lord, that you're with me. I dare you to pray that. Yeah, say it just like this. Come on, say it with me. Say it. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Lord, Thank you, Lord. For, this pain. for this pain. Thank you for developing me. Thank you for, developing. for loving me. Give me this love tap. Yeah. You got me. Yeah. Number three, the third way we can respond to, to discipline is you can be angry and resented. That way you don't accept it. Mm. Uh, God, forget it. I'm mad at you. A lot of times, we wonder about the troubles and the storms in our life. We think that God induced these things. But in actuality, we bring it on ourselves. And what God does is he starts to he'll correct you and still have his hand around you to protect you. So he's correcting and he's protecting. And then watch this. He's directing you which way to go. Only God can do that. He's protecting me in the midst of my trouble. He's correcting me in the midst of my frustration, and he's using that to point me in the right direction, which way I should go. That is correction, protection, and direction. And the order it really works is, is protection first. He protects you because you should have been dead. The wage of the sin is death. death, but the gift of God is eternal life. life. So he protects me. Then he says, okay, I'm correcting this. Let me correct some things. And then he points me in the right direction all at the same time. It's not Drake. <laughs> the fourth way. You can accept it with the correct response. And here's the correct response. Be grateful for a loving father. That's why I said, mm, it hurts, but thank you, father. It's profitable now in correcting you correction is profitable let me say this this way I'll put it this way correction is profitable now for your correction for correcting it's, it's, it's profitable right now 
And it's also profitable for your future because, again, it's pointing you in the right direction. So next time you see a joker come around or next time you're going through something because you're going to either be in a valley moment or you're going to be in the hilltop. It's a constant movement of and flow. So whatever I am, I've learned from what I've experienced before. And that creates a self-discipline in me. Because I was disciplined back here, I know not to do something right here. Unfortunately, in our society, we want the schools, we want the police, those in government and law enforcement to raise our children. I'm going off on a bit of a tangent, but it still is relatable. We want somebody else to do the hard work for us. It's not easy. Because think about when you were a child. <laughs> Lord, please. I'm thinking about myself now. I'm like, Lord, please don't let grace be like that. But I'm, I think about these moments because what happens is when I step my child, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they're older, they will not depart from it. If I'm not training them here, somebody else is. Right. Right. And we think, well, no, no, they're learning how to do this. No. See, again, children not only learn by what they hear, they learn by what they see. So if you're not telling me difference, some people, I don't tell them about this. My parents taught us about sex early on. Because they knew, even though we live in the 80s, they knew when we get to school, you're going to get exposed to so much. And, and it's tough for us as believers. We don't like to answer certain questions. I'll be honest with you, as a pastor, you have, I've had some of the most daunting questions that come to me. I mean, seriously daunting. And, and it, it would make your mind spin. I'm like, you don't want to give a cliche answer, but it's like, okay, go pray about it. <laughs> what does God say to do? Is there a check in your spirit? Like, it's because uh, Sean and Jalen can attest to this too, because one of the things they're doing with our youth, our young adults, they're going to start talking about sex, and, we, and we're going to do it in biblically, Holy Spirit led and biblically fed. And it's like, we want to start talking about these things because when they're out there, they're exposed to so much. Yeah. 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 And think about this poop or waste is created by what you take in. So if I'm constantly taking in things in my life that are not good for me, trust and believe my wastes is going to reflect that. Because my body doesn't need it. And the same thing is true when it comes to the word of God. When God is disciplining us, he's like, I'm helping you right here. This for a moment doesn't feel good. This for a moment is does not the best thing. I know you may want to get angry. I know you may get frustrated. Just don't withdraw from me because I'm looking for your future. And I'm also looking at what took place in your past. Not just your past, but generationally. Now here's a little deeper. Let's go a little deeper. DNA. You know what DNA is, right? So DNA, everything, how your body functions now is it, it's an exact, not necessarily a replica, but it comes about because of what your parents experienced. The same thing takes place spiritually. The doors that you closed in your life, your children won't have to face. The soul ties or the things you cut off they don't have to experience it. They'll come knocking, but they already become an overcomer to that area. If you don't cut it off, if you don't deal with those things in the past, inevitably they're going to come to the future. And the future is not your present, but it's your children's children's present. So they'll be facing things that you dealt with back here. It'll be a different time, a different place, a different person, but the same situation. And based on how you handled it, if you were disciplined enough or allowed God to discipline you so you had self-discipline in him, not in and of yourself. I'm not talking about willpower. There's something different. But I'm talking about self-discipline based on what God has buffeted me or what he has shaped me to be and do and called me and how he's called me and how he's shaped me and trained me to handle this. This allows me to be an overcomer over here and inevitably it gives my children the advantage over there. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, it's 7.51. You ready to see this demonstration? Yeah. All right. So, we're talking about dirty diapers. And mind you, I just got the D. So next week, we're going to talk about I, A, P, E, R, S, if we get to all of it at the same time.
Is that okay? Yes. Does this make sense? Yes. We're talking about what? Growing up. Growing up. What's the name of the series? Growing up. And what's the name of this particular message? Dirty diapers. Dirty diapers. It's time to clean your... Put your hand on your head. Say, Jesus, help me. Please help me. All right. Y'all know what this is? You know what this is? This is not gracious stuff. This is actually Church of the Harvest. Hey, dude, shout out. I was not going to haul her stuff. <laughs> this is called a changing table. This is a changing table. And the thing about a changing table is, what you do is, you get your child, and you put your child on a changing table. They may be squirming, they may be moving, but you put them on this table, why? So you can prepare the table. To examine them? No, so that you can change them. That's our praise and worship leader right there. Because <laughs> we can what? You can change them. Because we can change them. God does this with us. And I, I, I meant to have a baby doll, but... We have a multicultural church. I didn't know whether to get black or white. <laughs> That's a joke. I really don't know. I was going to get a teddy bear. But I couldn't find Grace didn't have those. She didn't have teddy bears. So what, what happens is, God does this. He, he sees us, and he's like, hmm, you're still a babe. Good. All right, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to put you on my table. I'm going to put you right here. Some people pull up Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He make me to lie down in green patches. He lead me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He lead me the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they have comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Anoint my head with oil. Okay, you can stop right there, Michelle. I love it, though. I love it. But he puts us on the table. He puts on his table. There's several tables. One, the first table God does, he prepares a table. This is where we commune with God, where we eat with him. Okay. The second table is where God uses to change us. In the holies of holies, there is a table there. Where they, what they did was they took the table, and this is where they had an exchange. They killed the animal, and the blood flowed out. But then there was a cleansing table. And for us, many of us squirmer, we get irritable, we get upset because God is laying us down. He stops us for the moment. Mm. He's like, ah, no, no, God, I, I want to keep going. I want to do this for nothing. Stop. You don't realize something. I smell you. There's a stench in my nostrils. There's some waste. You may not know it. You think you can keep walking. And listen, you feel irritable, but you're getting comfortable with it. God didn't want you to get comfortable. Because if you get comfortable with feces, what happens? You're going to create a rash. Yes. And if that rash is not taken care of, you're going to create bacteria. And if that bacteria is not taken care of, it keeps leading us to progression, progression of death. Yeah. But God has to stop us. Hey, stop at this table. He lays us down at this table. And he takes us. I'm changing your old diaper for a new diaper. I'm putting on something new. I'm going to bring some discipline into your life. You don't like it. You may not want it. But trust and believe this is what you need for the moment. That's good. So he puts it there. He puts us down. He changes us. And it's like, hmm, you feel better. We go out. We go out. We go back and do the same thing over again. Yep. And he does it one time, two times, yeah. three times, yeah. four times, 1,500 times. He constantly changes us. He's constantly working with us. He's constantly making us right. And it gets to a point where it's like, okay, I've been changing you. And you've gotten, to, you've gotten used to me picking you up and changing you and making sure that you're clean. Now I want you to get used to it. I want you to get potty trained. I want to remove the table. And I want to give you a pull-up. I want you to take something that, you, that, you're, that you're not used to. I want you to take something that, that, that is brand new for you. I don't want you to learn how to change for yourself. That's right. 
Well, I don't have to stop you. But even in the midst, this is when it looks like this. The first step is God stops you. The second step, he asks you to keep going, but he changes you while you're going. This is why most of you are still going through stuff. And you're like, why, God, are you still using me? Why do you still use me to pray for somebody else? Why are you asking me to give? I got my own stuff. He says, because in the midst of you changing yourself or me changing you, you're still helping somebody else. You're still walking a path. I don't have to stop right there on that table anymore. You're progressing. Now, I did not bring a big pair of underwear with me. Because I thought about that. You have to pray about that. But what happens is this. Just like from bottles to cups, God moves us from diapers to undies. To briefs. So y'all sophisticated people, panties. Or they say in London, knickers. It's knickers. That's what it's called, knickers. He moves us from that. Why? Because over here, he does the changing. Over here, we do the changing. Okay. Notice, he's doing all the work there. Over here, I'm working with him. Okay. And that's when it comes down to us understanding part of maturity, again, is taking responsibility. Being responsible enough to know when my stuff stinks. Being responsible enough to know that I need to be changed. Get that word. I need to be changed. I'm constantly changed. And in three, allowing God to change me even in the midst of me walking on his path. Allowing God to still do the work in me where he protects me, he corrects me, and he still directs me in the way I need to go. That's it. And next week we're going to go deeper. That's it. That's it. We got one minute. Valerie Jocelyn Wheeler.